ministry, the Indian <coughs> ministry, which they started in 2015, after they completed their certification in creation apologetics through the Creation Training Initiative in Boise, Idaho. And that, that ministry is an offshoot of Answers in Genesis. Uh, Answers in Genesis is who built the Creation Museum, and who built the, the life-size Noah's Ark in, uh, in the Cincinnati area. And in 2022, they both earned their certification in dispensational studies through the Berean Bible Institute. To their knowledge, BJ and Diana are the only certified creation apologetic instructors in the United States who are also mid acts Pauline rightly divided. This has created a unique focus for their ministry. So, real pleasure to us to have BJ and Diana with us. So with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to BJ. Thank you. It's good to be here this morning. Uh, as David kind of alluded to, so our home church is Grace Bible Believers. It's in Chardon, Ohio, which is Geauga County, so a little north and east of here. As David said, Jason Plant is our pastor. I believe he's met a number of you people uh, through the years. And we think every Sunday about you folks here at Columbus Bible Church because the blue chairs that you used to have <laughs> before you remodeled this gorgeous space, well, you graciously gave those to us. So here on the screen we have some pictures. This is our little, little home church in Chardon, Ohio. So uh, on behalf of Jason and Catherine and our church, thank you again for your generosity. Uh, as David mentioned, my wife Diana and I, Diane is in the back, hopefully you get a chance to say hello to her before the day's done. We have a Creation Apologetics Ministry, and it'll be 10 years this June since we completed our certification. And in that time, we've heard things like, creation's not a salvation issue. Just focus on the gospel. Don't get sidetracked with these debate, creation debates. In fact, one pastor up where we live told us directly it's not about the age of rocks. It's about the rock of ages. Just point them to Jesus and the rest will take care of itself. Well, with all respect, he's wrong. Creation matters. When we ignore or reject what the Bible says about the beginning of everything, we call into question the very truth of the rest of Scripture, including the gospel. The book of Genesis is foundational to the rest of Scripture. To illustrate my point, here's my Bible. It's hard to tell, but this is the front of it. If I turn it like this, where the top is now on the bottom, this shows that the book of Genesis is foundational to the rest of Scripture. It's a good picture to illustrate that point. Everything in the Bible is inseparably bound up in the book of Genesis. Think about it. If the events in the first three chapters of Genesis didn't happen, then there was no reason for the rest of the Bible to be written. And the events of creation affect major biblical doctrines like the inerrancy of Scripture, sin, death, life, and as we'll see this morning, the events in Genesis even impact the mystery revealed to the Apostle Paul. Given how important the first 11 chapters of Genesis are, it's no wonder that they're the most attacked and doubted in all of the Bible. They document the establishment of gender, marriage, faith, family structure, order and authority, all the things that are under attack in our world today. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalm 11.3 seems maybe more relevant today than when it was written some 3,000 years ago. In 2 Timothy 2.15, which I saw somewhere on the back counter where Stephanie is back there, I, I saw it there, the Apostle Paul instructs us to study to show ourselves workmen. And while most Christians are familiar with the major events of Genesis chapters 1 through 11, so of course we're talking about creation, we're talking about the fall, we're talking about the flood, and we're talking about the Tower of Babel, what we found in our ministry is that most people have really not studied these events. So there's a lack of knowledge about this foundational information, and that's where Satan attacks, just like he did in the Garden of Eden with Eve. So Begin Ministries exists, as you see here on the screen, 
to uphold biblical authority, to bring down strongholds, that means errors in thinking, and to equip and edify believers. Brother David, we appreciate you having here this morning, and I know from, we've seen a lot of your videos, we know that this is a church that believes in the authority of Scripture from the very first verse, and that, believe me, is a big encouragement to us, so thank you. Now, if you've been a grace believer for any amount of time, you've probably heard the criticisms falsely made that all we do is focus on the Apostle Paul and that we ignore the rest of Scripture. Well, this morning, as we examine the genesis of Paul's gospel, we're going to see that it's actually rooted in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, which in fact, Paul did not write. However, as we'll discover, he was the most influential interpreter of the first three chapters of that book. Now, you may be aware there's an ever-increasing movement on the part of Christianity to doubt the existence of a real Adam and Eve. They've come to regard the first couple as symbolic, myth, or metaphor, characters in a fictional account that was written before man invented science. This morning, we're going to explore the theological necessity of a real historic Adam and Eve, both to Paul's mystery gospel and to the church, the body of Christ. As we prepare to look into God's Word, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the saints here this morning at Columbus Bible Church, and pray that as we study your Word, you'll open hearts and minds to its life-changing truth. In your Son's name I pray, amen. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. This is going to be the first place we'll be in Scripture today, but it won't be the last time we're here, so a recommendation is to keep your finger, to keep it marked. So in Romans, there's kind of a symbiotic relationship between that book and the book of Genesis. Romans explains what God's been doing for the past 2,000 years of man's history, while the book of Genesis, specifically chapters 1 through 11, explains how God intervened in man's history for the first 2,000 years. Follow along as I read in Romans chapter 5. I'm going to begin in verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. In this passage, Paul provides the reason why we need salvation. We're all sinners. And why are we all sinners? Because of one man. And Paul identifies him in verse 12. And we know that the one man that Paul is talking about is the Adam of Genesis, because in verse 14, Paul gives to, us, gives to us his name, and he gives us a time frame from Moses, excuse me, from Adam to Moses. So there's no mistaking who the culprit is. Now, maybe the first row people can see this, I'm not sure, but we're, we're, having, we're having a little bit of fun here. If you can't see it, it says Adam's crime was listening to his wife. Clearly, things have changed since the Garden of Eden, because some 6,000 years later, we men know that we normally get into trouble when we don't listen to our lives. Amen. Yeah, and you're, la and you're laughing, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it had serious consequences when it happened, but yeah, so we're having a little fun there. Now, verse 14 speaks of a stretch of time from Adam to Moses. So, Paul clearly recognized both Adam and Moses as real historic people. In this passage, Paul's taking us back to the beginning, back to the Garden of Eden, and in doing so, he provides the Bible's explanation for the origin of sin and death. Now, let's park here for, ju uh, for just a moment to gain a little perspective. For all our lives, we've had the benefit of the full completed canon of Scripture. We've all known the Old Testament 
and the New Testament. It's all we've ever known. It's been some 2,000 years since the Apostle Paul penned his epistles, and when the Holy Spirit inspired him to write those letters back in the first century, his theology was groundbreaking. It is not an exaggeration to say it was radical. It was revolutionary. Here in Romans, Paul's pointing the finger at Adam, and he's holding him accountable for bringing sin and death into the world. This was a breathtaking pronouncement. Paul is placing on to Adam the power to determine the destiny of the rest of humanity. And in doing so, Paul is connecting dots that had never been connected before. Never. Prior to Paul, no other biblical writer had ever characterized Adam as the original sinner and the reason we die. In fact, when we read through the Bible, outside the first five chapters of Genesis, Adam practically disappears from the pages of Scripture, only to be resurrected, so to speak, by the Apostle Paul. Outside of the first five chapters in Genesis, Paul actually writes more about Adam than anyone else in the entire Bible, mentioning Adam uh, by name seven times in 13 epistles. And while that might not seem like a lot on the surface, consider this. There are a total of 1,189 chapters in the entire Bible. Yet outside of Genesis and Paul's epistles, Adam's mentioned by name just five times in the entire Bible. Three times in the Old Testament and twice in the New Testament. Adam is central to Paul's revolutionary theology, which he deeply roots in Genesis and in the events in the Garden. Now, by way of comparison, let's briefly examine the theology Peter was preaching. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. I'm sure you're all familiar with the account of Pentecost. I'm going to begin reading at verse 22. So again, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now drop down, if you would, to verse 36. Same chapter, chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the first thing to note, of course, is Peter's audience. To whom is he speaking? He's speaking to the men of Israel and the house of Israel. So Peter's audience is to the Jews. It's not to Gentiles. Second thing to look at, what's the content of his message? He wrote that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter uses the cross to convict and condemn his audience. And he repeats this same litany of charges in Acts chapter 3 as well. In fact, every time Peter preaches here in early Acts, he indicts his audience with the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad news that Israel had crucified their Messiah. And that's the reason he told his audience they needed to repent and be baptized, because ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain the Messiah. Now, in light of what we just read in Romans chapter 5, do you see what's missing from Peter's message? There's no mention of Adam. None. Paul roots his gospel and the very need for salvation in the person of Adam 
yet he's completely missing from Peter's message. The role Adam plays in Paul's theology makes his historical reality an integral part of Paul's gospel. That makes Adam central to our sin, as we read in Romans, but it also makes Adam central to our salvation. Let's return again to Romans chapter 5. And this time I'm going to begin in verse 17. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the, three, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Here, Paul is contrasting the sin of one man, Adam, with the righteousness of the one man, Jesus Christ. In Paul's theology, Adam is the origin of death, and Jesus is the origin of life. Notice throughout the passage, Paul speaks of Adam in the same way he speaks of Christ. So the language suggests that Paul considered Adam a historical, real figure. And what's more, his entire argument depends on it. Paul's argument that he just made would collapse into utter nonsense if he were comparing a historical man, Jesus, with a mythical man, Adam. In these verses and throughout the book of Romans, we see Paul connecting dots that had never been connected before because, again, prior to Paul, no other biblical author had ever made this direct connection between Adam and Christ. That was, for the time, radical. Dr. James Barr, one of the most significant Bible scholars and linguists of the 20th century, wrote, it is important to perceive that this analogy, and he was speaking about the comparison between Adam and Jesus, is very much Paul's own property. Dr. Barr recognized Paul's departure from the rest of the New Testament, as we see from this quote. The typology of Adam and Christ is absent from the teaching of Jesus, from the Gospels in general, from the other Johannine literature, from Hebrews, Peter and James, from everything. When we come to realize just how radical Paul's writings were for the first century, it maybe helps us to understand why the Apostle Peter confessed that certain things Paul wrote were hard for some to understand. Paul's theology was a complete paradigm shift, and by that I mean his teachings fundamentally changed the underlying assumptions about sin, life, uh, death, Christ, and salvation. As Dr. Barr himself observed, Jesus himself, though he noted some features of the early Genesis story, in other respects shows no interest in Adam or Eve as the persons who brought sin and death into the world. Now, for the past 2,000 years, Christianity has tried to do one of two things with Paul's writings. They've either tried to harmonize them with the rest of the New Testament, or many times they've just tried to simply explain them away. In fact, some theologians have gone so far to characterize Paul as a creative thinker who contributed his own inventive reading to the Genesis account. In other words, they think Paul went rogue. Well, that's astonishing when we consider that the Bible claims for itself to be the very Word of God, and Paul stated both in Corinthians and Thessalonians that his epistles were the Word of God, and in Thessalonians he even states that they were received as such. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, and I'm going to begin at verse 15. An account, oh, I still hear pages. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 
an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved, beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So here we have the Apostle Peter himself putting Paul's writings on the same par with the rest of Holy Scripture. Now, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 3. When you get there, turn down to verse 23. So when you get to that part in this particular section of Scripture, from verse 23 through verse 38, you'll notice that this is Luke's genealogy of Jesus. It's one of those genealogies with a whole bunch of names that a lot of us find very hard to pronounce. Many of us, if we're being honest, probably just skip right over them and Okay, let's get on to the next part of Scripture. Well, we find in this genealogy, the good doctor is tracing Jesus' family tree back to Adam, and then ultimately in verse 38, to God. First, notice the placement in Scripture of this genealogy. He doesn't place it at the beginning of a book, like we see in Matthew chapter 1, and it doesn't even start its own chapter, like Adam's family tree does in Genesis chapter 5. Now, of course, we know that these chapter and verse divisions came much later. They weren't part of the original text. Nonetheless, Luke's genealogy is sandwiched well into the narrative, beginning in Luke chapter 3, verse 23. And since Luke recorded the actual account of Jesus' Jesus birth in chapter 2, well, it seems like that would have been the natural place to put this genealogy. Instead, we find Luke slipping it in between the account of Jesus' baptism and his temptation in the wilderness. And that's just a very curious place to place a genealogy. Something else to note, this genealogy is structurally unique. It's the only one in Scripture that's in reverse. It goes backwards in time. Luke arranges it son to father, beginning with Jesus, and working backwards to Adam. When we compare that to Jesus' genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, we notice that that list begins with Abraham and works forward to Jesus. So the names are in the more traditional father-to-son arrangement with all those begats that everybody just loves. With his strategic placement, Luke is using Jesus' genealogy as a literary device to introduce his temptation in the wilderness. And its unique son-to-father backward structure allows Luke to end the lineage with the words, the son of Adam, which was the son of God, which leads directly into the temptation in the wilderness. Luke connects Adam and Jesus by their mutual temptation experiences and by their common heritage as the sons of God. In Luke 3.22, The Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus, and God testifies that Jesus is His Son. Now, you would think that would be pretty authoritative, but just a few verses later, in chapter 4, verse 3, Satan has the audacity to question who Jesus is. He says, if thou be the Son of God. Both Adam and Jesus are sons of God, but it's only Jesus who Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, identified as the last Adam and the second man, who prevailed over the devil. Satan questioned Jesus' identity, but Christ knew who he was, and he stood in the power of the truth and the authority of the Word of God. Now, Adam was a son of God, too, but he certainly didn't act like it, and that's a lesson for us all. We need to know who we are in Christ, and it's through Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, where we learn who we are after salvation. So what is our identity after salvation? Paul's gospel message proclaims the glorious news 
that believers have been delivered from their old position in Adam, that's in Adam's sin and condemnation, into a new position in Christ where there is no condemnation. When we're saved, we're no longer dead in our trespasses and sins. We are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Amen? Oh, right on cue. I didn't even have to say it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we know Luke sometimes traveled with Paul on his missionary journeys, and he spent the two years with him in Rome when he was under house arrest. So Luke had plenty of opportunities to hear Paul preach, and, a lot, and they spent a lot of time together. So you can just imagine the conversations that they would have had. Given this association between Luke and Paul, it's really not surprising when we encounter Paul's unique Adam Christ analogy in Luke's writings. And when we study it out, the genealogy, we discover it's not just a dusty list of names that we can't pronounce. Buried within the positioning and structure of Jesus' genealogy, Luke's inspired text affirms Paul's theology just as Peter did. So for those who have an issue with what Paul wrote, well, that's a slippery slope because that means they also have an issue with what Luke and Peter wrote. There's no need to explain away the writings of Paul. He was not going rogue. Paul himself explains why his theology is so different than what's found in the rest of the New Testament. In Romans 16, 25, he writes that the information given to him was part of the mystery which had been kept secret since the foundation of the world. And in fact, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, he reveals the mystery had actually been hid in God. Paul even tells us why the mystery had been hid in God. Because had the princes of this world known God's plan, they would never have crucified Jesus. When we rightly divide Scripture, it allows us to recognize and understand the differences in the teachings of Peter and Paul. Thank you, brother. When we started this morning, I said there were two areas we were going to examine regarding the theological necessity of a real historic Adam and Eve. One was about Paul's mystery gospel. The other was about the church, the body of Christ. We noted earlier that Dr. James Barr had said that the Adam-Jesus analogy was very much the Apostle Paul's own property. That's the same with the church, the body of Christ, because it's only in Paul's epistles where we read about a church called the body of Christ. Please turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 31 and 32. Chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Paul states that the union of one man and one woman was part of the mystery concerning Christ and the church. Well, think through this with me, if you would. Marriage. <laughs> okay, great. We've, we've got more Princess Bride fans out here than, than we maybe expected. If you have no idea what's up on the screen, please talk to someone that just laughed, and they will explain this to you later. <laughs> Marriage itself... Marriage itself, let's get back to being serious. Marriage itself wasn't a mystery. It's been around since the beginning, as recorded in Genesis 2.25, where Eve is called Adam's wife. And the man being the head, well, that wasn't new either. That had been the order from the beginning. Adam was created first, and then Eve. And after the fall, we read in Genesis 3 that the husband's role was that of a ruler who protects. The headship of the husband was established in the beginning. So that wasn't a mystery. So what then does Paul mean that the union of one man and one woman was part of the mystery concerning Christ and the church? 
to provide a little context, I've asked Brother David to come up, and he's going to read here from Ephesians, so stay right where you are, Ephesians chapter 5, and he's going to read from verses 22 to 32. Thank you, Brother. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Thank you. As you may have noticed, in this passage, Paul references the book of Genesis, specifically Genesis 2, quite a bit. So up on the monitor, we have part of the Ephesians passage that David just read, along with a few verses from Genesis. We've color-coded the phrases to make it easy to see the Genesis connection Paul is making. So highlighted in red in the Ephesians passage, Paul writes, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then in Genesis, up top, also highlighted in red, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Then highlighted in blue in the Ephesians passage, Paul writes, Shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And in Genesis, also highlighted in blue, we read, A man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now we saw in Romans where Paul identified Adam as a picture of Jesus. Well, here in Ephesians, Paul is equating the husband-wife relationship of Adam and Eve to the relationship Jesus would have to the church, the body of Christ. It's the earthly image of the divine plan, a God-ordained permanent union between Jesus and the church, the body of Christ. Yet, prior to being revealed to the Apostle Paul, this had been part of the mystery, which had been kept hidden God from the foundation of the world. This is the first time that it was ever known. Hopefully, you see when we said this stuff is, was radical for the time, really radical, really revolutionary. As I said earlier of the Adam and Jesus analogy, the same applies here. It's obvious that Paul's arguments would collapse into utter nonsense if Adam and Eve weren't real people. This morning, we've examined Paul's writings and established the theological necessity of a real historic Adam and Eve, the first couple of the Bible, both to Paul's mystery gospel and to the church, the body of Christ. I stated at the beginning that if the events in Genesis chapters 1 through 3 didn't happen, then there'd be no need for the very rest of the Bible. If Adam and Eve weren't real people, then there was no need for a real Jesus to suffer and die as an atonement for the sins of humanity. And yet he did. For what? Fake first couple who were really just myth and metaphor? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, Jesus certainly didn't think that Adam and Eve were fake news. As we see here, he spoke about Adam and Eve in Matthew 19.4, and in Mark 10.6 he said, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. 
And Jesus also spoke of their son Abel in Matthew 23, 35. And in Luke eleven fifty one, 51, he said, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah. In none of these accounts did Jesus ever use any stipulations to even remotely suggest that he doubted the historical reality of Adam and Eve. So this begs the question, was Jesus wrong? Well, the answer, of course, is no, Jesus wasn't wrong. It's the rest of today's church that's getting it wrong. They're consigning Adam and Eve to the dustbin of symbolism, myth, and metaphor. Taken to its logical conclusion, we see this has devastating consequences. Evolution utter, destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble, you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. Atheists like this writer realize the significance of destroying a real historic Adam and Eve. Sadly, the church does not. Without a real Adam and Eve, the Bible loses its basis for the fall, for sin, for death, for the need for redemption, and the need for Jesus and atonement. It's simply impossible to remove a real historic Adam and Eve from Paul's revolutionary theology and for it to remain intact. The record of Scripture is clear. The mystery revealed to Paul by Christ provides the strongest evidence for the theological necessity of a real historic Adam and Eve. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. I pray that our study this morning has been an encouragement and has edified those here today. If there are any who have not trusted in the finished work of your son Jesus on the cross for their salvation, we pray that they would do so today. Bless us this week in our homes and jobs, and may we walk worthy of the calling you have given us as ambassadors of Christ with the mystery of reconciliation to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery you revealed to the Apostle Paul. Amen. 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 BJ and Diana, thank you.